Heather Well, she is a professor of pure mathematics at the School of Mathematics in the University of Bristol. He's a reference, he's a mathematician, philosopher, president of the British Logic Colloquium and vice president of European Set Theory Society. Um, he will speak us about the shape of things to come, the fate of mathematical gesture. And uh, for me, it's very interesting the, this uh, talk because we are going to uh, rethink about the figure of the professor, as I understand in the abstract of uh, this uh, speech that we will start. So here you have the word, please. Okay. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction and thank you, Myrna, uh, for giving me the chance to give um, some thoughts here at this meeting. I mean, it's been a wonderful meeting so far. Um, I've been really impressed at uh, the wide range of the talks and even visionary aspects of it that people have. So I, I hope this is audible um, from where I'm standing. Yeah, it is. It is? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me know if anything goes wrong, of course. <clears throat> so the title, Shape of Things to Come, uh, this harkens back to the writer H.G. Wells, uh, often said to be Pache Jelzen, the originator of true, true science fiction. Whilst I don't want to argue this point, uh, perhaps he can be granted the title of the first futurologist. Uh, he thought not so much in deep space, uh, but that too, but uh, also in deep time. So the impetus for this meeting is the futurology of a post-corona world, and this prompts various thoughts. But like the advice uh, to would-be novelists, talk about what you know. So what I want to uh, discuss uh, actually has already been raised uh, on mon Monday afternoon by Menachem's talk, and the discussion following. The way higher education may change. So, I said earlier, the talks, you know, they've, they've had a wide sweep and a visionary, um, visionary focus. And perhaps paradoxically or quixotically, I've gone completely the other way. And I'm just going to consider a really tiny drop in the ocean of the world's problems at the moment. And even more so when I zoom in on, uh, bad pun involuntarily intended, on the detail of mostly the undergraduate teaching. At times I should be even more parochial as there'll be further remarks about the university environment in the UK, <clears throat> which restricts the scope of some, but only some of my points, I think, um, to a small part of the globe. <clears throat> uh, I'm also all too conscious that I'm speaking from a very privileged viewpoint. Uh, several speakers have brought up issues of social equity, of the access to higher education being proportionate to social income and to other injustices of the social systems that are likely to occur post-COVID. <clears throat> if I mention this only now to seem then to pass over it, it's not that I don't recognize it. I'm just being deliberately narrow in my focus. As any of us are, uh, well, um, as any of us involved in university teaching know, <clears throat> much of it's been moved online, at least since March, possibly for many institutions in the Northern Hemisphere, for the autumn also. There are concomitant dangers to this, as I see it. Part of my discussion really is only continuation of that that's been had many times before in the last decade, <clears throat> with the advent of massive online open courses, which were much trumpeted and don't seem to have taken over the world yet. Right? but also the online course offerings of the kind produced by Coursera. So one danger is that university administrators will seek to use this as an opportunity to kind of bed in teaching as semi-permanent, sorry, bed in online teaching as sort of semi-permanent, perhaps just starting with it now to experiment with its uh, normalizing effect. <clears throat> one could revisit some of the objections that have been made to massive open online courses and probably many of us are aware of such, but I don't want to repeat these. As Miri Sigal mentioned, we may already be in this brave new world and there is no going back. Uh, so very likely. And also in many ways, it's hard to argue against the direction of travel. 
I mean, the stream is towards increased digitization. There's the democratic aspect of the leveling of access to higher education, even prestigious higher education, judging by some of Coursera's clients. And who wants to begrudge uh, the smallest village in the Outer Hebrides or the Deccan access to a course from Stanford? Online courses are a solid democratizing rock to hurl against the, uh, the portcullis of the higher education gatekeepers. And yet, I think what is missing with online education is education. To particularize to mathematics now, there's no doubt that mathematical training can be done online. Elementary courses on first year linear algebra and calculus are not for me a thin end of the wedge. They're subjects which cry out for the online course. In the future, introductory courses on diagonalizing matrices, and finding substitutions for integrals, these will look as archaic as training in extracting square roots or the use of logarithm tables. This can all be, it is done on computers. <clears throat> okay, so this, this brings me to the subtitle, gesture. Uh, missing out on eye contact by the speaker with the student has been discussed. Uh, I, as a lecturer, can be aware of when I'm losing the students, when my explanations have fallen short, when I need to retrace my narrative. It's perhaps seemingly only an arguably small point, but it is one part of the dynamic. <clears throat> However, I want to talk about a, another part of that teacher's, uh, student, lecturer, listener dynamic. I think there's going to be a subliminal, perhaps even greater loss on the part of the audience. I don't see, I don't have eye contact with students, but the audience do not see my gestures, unless everything is filmed faithfully from beginning to end. I think without that, I'd want to claim here that there is uh, also a key part of the dynamic. There's a body of evidence um, so by Nunes, uh, Henderson and others, that gesture adds to mathematical learning. At first sight, when I read this, <laughs> it seemed to be somewhat exaggerated. But on reflection, there is perhaps more to it. And indeed, neurological cognitive studies show that this is, as this is the case. I mean, not just the usual examples amongst two-year-olds learning to count, but adults learning epsilon delta arguments in calculus. <laughs> So uh, I have a list here from Nunes, um, where he gives reference works to other authors' experimental works. Uh, so one, <clears throat> gestures, although to an extent unconscious, are often quite synchronized to fractions of a second of speech in patterns specific to the speaker's language. Two, gesture and speech develop uh, closely linked. Studies in language acquisition and child development show that speech and gesture develop in parallel. Gesture three, gesture provides complementary knowledge. Studies show that speakers synthesize and subsequently cannot distinguish information taken from the two channels. Four, gestures are co-processed with speech. Studies show that stutterers stutter in gesture too and that impending hand gestures interrupt speech production. Sorry, impeding hand gestures. No, I think that's impending hand gestures interrupt speech production. Persons with neurological damage to speech centers suffer less loss of hand gesture as well as loss of speech. And perhaps particularly for um, mathematicians or people teaching uh, in the abstract, five gestures are co-produced with abstract metaphorical thinking. So linguistic metaphorical mappings are paralleled systematically in gesture. So perhaps there is then more to this than meets the eye, so eye contact. Um, and perhaps this gives those of us that wish to keep uh, a key part of education as opposed to in the training gives us some ammunition to hurl from inside the ivory tower. <laughs> Although this may little help, peer-reviewed studies show that grades of university students declined 
when they had access to online recordings of their lectures. But this has not stopped universities in the UK offering the service to the customer student. Okay, let's try some uh, gestural evidence. Um, so what I've got is a clip of the renowned physicist and teacher, Richard Feynman, giving a class on elementary particles at Cornell. Numbers are. But the thing that's very remarkable is this, that for the nuclear forces, which are the strong forces inside the nucleus, the force between a pair of protons, two protons, is the same as between a proton and a neutron, and is the same again between a neutron and a neutron. In other words, for the strong nuclear forces, you can't tell a proton from a neutron. Or a symmetry law. Neutrons may be substituted for protons without changing anything, provided you're only talking about the strong forces. If you're talking about electrical forces, oh no. If you change a neutron for a proton, you have terrible difference because the proton carries electrical charge and a neutron doesn't. So by electrical measurement, immediately you can see the difference between a proton and a neutron. So this symmetry, that you can replace neutrons by protons, is what we call an approximate symmetry. It's right for the strong interactions and nuclear forces. But it's not right in some deep sense in nature because it doesn't work for the electricity. This is called a partial symmetry and we have to struggle with these partial symmetries. Now the families have been extended. It turns out that the substitution neutron proton can be extended to substitution over a wider range of particles, but the accuracy is still lower. You see, that neutrons can always be substituted for protons is only approximate, it's not true for electricity. And that the wider substitutions that have been discovered are legitimate is still more poor, a very poor uh, symmetry, not very accurate. But they have helped to gather the particles into families and thus to locate places where particles are missing. And to but in that clip, Feynman uses what you might call explanatory gestures, triggered by words such as substitution, right, with a rotation of the hand equalities of charge, moving hands up and down, and location of particles, much more directed pointing. In the second clip, the gestures are more confirmatory or delivering emphasis rather than explanatory. Right? He's talking about theories being wrong. Perhaps they disagree with the environment. And he talks also about environmental confirmation. It's wrong. In that simple statement, is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. It's true, however, that one has to check a little bit to make sure that it's wrong, because someone who did the experiment may have reported incorrectly, or there may have been some feature in the experiment that wasn't noticed, like some kind of dirt and so on. That's have the obvious check. Furthermore, the man who computed the consequences, even it may have been the same one who made the guesses, may have made some mistake in the analysis. Those are obvious remarks. So when I say, if it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong, I mean, after the experiment has been checked, the calculations have been checked, and the thing has been rubbed back and forth a few times to make sure that the consequences are logical consequences from the, hype, from the guess, and that in fact it disagrees with a very carefully checked experiment. In the next clip, um, the mathematician Terry Tao is talking about ordinary lines. So those not containing more than two points from a prescribed set. The hand gestures here can be quite specific. He talks about additive and multiplicative sets or subgroups of the reals. And if you study this closely over longer segments actually in this clip, he seems even to subconsciously reserve like, different hand gestures for the words additive and multiplicative. So multiplicative is this way round, and additive is this way round. And other concepts seem to consistently trigger different movements. And often the gestures end up as purely suggestive. What actually is also interesting, I found, actually, is um, how the viewer also absorbs these unsaid gestures, and you learn them very quickly during the course of the lecture. You use them as some sort of kind of quick guide in the rapid flow of concepts in the mathematics lecture. So um, elliptic curves generates for him uh, a rolling motion of the hand. Cases. So there's sort of there's a parallel case and then there's a non-parallel case like this. So the, the concurrent case um, where the three lines meet here they meet at infinity. 
and, and here um, they don't meet at all, or that they meet at different points. Um, you see, the, the, these are all sorts of de degenerations of elliptic curves, and this isn't a degeneration where we sort of, yeah, you, the group becomes the additive group of the reals, and this, here, here's where the group becomes sort of the multiplicative group of the reals. Um, so over here, the, the problem is that um, there is sort of a counterexample to, um, to the, the statement. If you're allowed to have an infinite number of points, if, if you are having, if you take an infinite arithmetic progression, um, or spacing one, spacing one, I think spacing half here. Okay, if you have say, three equally spaced lines, and if you take an infinite arithmetic progression here, here, and here, with here having twice the spacing, half the spacing, then, um, then there's no ordinary lines. Every, every, every line that goes to two of these points goes to a third. So this would be a counterexample. And if there were any finite subgroups of the reals, um, you, could, you could cook up a similar example using, using that finite subgroup to, um, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to ruin this lemma. But of course, there are no finite subgroups of the reals, but, yeah, yeah, you, but you need a robust version of that statement. There's, there's, there's not even anything that looks like a finite subgroup of the reals. And this is where some additive controversy comes in. So I would claim that these gestures that, um, that you see the speaker make during the course of a lecture, right, these become part of your, you know, these become part of the language. It becomes a shorthand when they want to talk about something or emphasize a particular aspect, some adjective or aspect of, you know, a noun or a concept that they're describing. And so, you know, they're perhaps um, not consciously doing this or they have these formed out of habit, but you can quite quickly pick up on this and it becomes an informational channel. So the moral might be that students find it hard to learn the 19th century via Strassian definition of continuity from static epsilon delta definitions, rather than perhaps the more intuitive notion of motion coming close or approximating to, which are typically taught with you know, the obvious gestures involved. So mathematicians here will know exactly how you could convey sequential convergence using some gestural description. So of course, one can't pretend that in any one situation, this cannot be realized by a cartoon clip or the overwriting of a digital pen on a whiteboard in a voiceover. However, what is in danger currently is the movement towards a two-tier system, a movement potentially accelerated by the current COVID crisis. For the more well-off, a university nearer to the traditional model, teaching by real life professors who interact with the students on an immediate person-to-person -person basis. Students will have access to both the person and the personality of the academic. And the second tier will be institutions running on the cheap. Recorded lecturers, perhaps produced in-house or purchased from somewhere, with possibly online recitation sessions by, as now, underpaid assistants. The outcome being an accumulation of credit points amounting finally to a certificate. There is no countering, I think, the utility of training or distance learning. The UK is a wonderful example of distance learning. The Open University, uh, which awards degrees, and in its early days, it used BBC broadcasts to channel the courses, and it has short summer schools set up by the Labour government under Harold Wilson in 1969. And this has become a, a great beacon for many years for those who've missed out on higher education. So this brings me again back to the UK. How the UK will system will be after COVID-19 is still a big question mark. Menachem mentioned in particular the UK and Australian systems. The background here in the UK is, as many know, the decision to marketize the UK university system by replacing the teaching subvention by the government for arts and humanities by a sharp increase in the fee regime there's a regime of lower fees, actually, as now of a thousand pounds was first introduced by the Blair government in the 90s. But fees went to 9,000 pounds overnight in 2012. This was, certainly, this was not the worst decision of the Cameron government, but certainly it was of the university's minister, David Willits. <clears throat> I think that the long-term international status of our universities has been undermined by this decision. And without some good luck, perhaps fatally, administrators openly talk of research as being a sink of money. 
Universities in the UK currently struggle at the best of times with the problem of performing in a market, either of their own choosing or their own acquiescence. But it's the worst of times. And having online, perhaps even addition to live course offerings, are seen as essential to bolster up plummeting numbers of that most welcome of customers, the lucrative overseas student. Why did I say online and live teaching? Because there's a rush fueled by near zero interest rates available for exciting new capital projects to expand student enrollment. But this has left uh, universities floundering after the COVID pandemic, as this potential student enrollment is, could be plunging. Having both modes of teaching offers a rationale for the high level of overseas student fees and an inducement to sign on the line. Online teaching is difficult to arrange. You can't simply put a camera on a tripod in an empty lecture hall. So we're all hoping for the best, but we have to keep tightly crossed our fingers. Okay, so from the gesture of fingers crossed, let's just go to my last clip and finish. This again is Richard Feynman. He's talking about shortcomings in current theories. Too many assumptions that taken together lead to inconsistency about how processes converging to an unfortunate infinity are somehow swept under the rug. And here this, this is interesting, there's something of embarrassment in his body language. Um, one has to listen closely, closely timed actually between the, the movements and actually what he says. And it's slightly more low key. But what you can see, he's, he's a little verklempt and constricted of a sudden. After watching this with the sound off, I was reminded of the medical neurologist Oliver Sacks's recollection of entering the aphasiacs ward in his New York hospital. Aphasia patients cannot process audible words meaningfully. Nevertheless, to compensate, they're extremely adept at picking up non-verbal clues. On the television, the president, Ronald Reagan, was speaking. Sachs was puzzled, as although they could not understand the meaning of Reagan's words, nevertheless they were, almost all of them, laughing. On being asked why, the answer was, although they could not understand what he was saying, he was clearly lying. That all conservation laws must be local. And so when we put all these principles together, we discover there are too many. They're inconsistent with each other. It seems as if, if we add quantum mechanics plus relativity plus the proposition that everything has to be local, plus a number of tacit assumptions which we can't really find out because we're prejudiced, we don't see what they are and it's hard to say what they are. Adding it all together we get inconsistency because we really get infinity for various things when we calculate them. Well, if we get infinity, how will we ever agree that this agrees with nature? It turns out that it's possible to sweep the infinities under the rug by a certain crude skill and temporarily we're able to keep on calculating but the fact of the matter is that all the principles that I told you up till now if put together plus some tacit assumptions that we don't know is uh, gives trouble they cannot mutually consistent nice problem thank you very much that's all I have interesting and a little bit pessimistic view I, I hope it will be different because the previous day here we have a different point of view about the future of the of the figure of professor so for youngsters it seems to be the um, the clear future that we are going to work through the online systems but yesterday uh, we talk about the confinement of human of the senses so maybe it's the point that uh, you are expressing in this wonderful speech Ho Sorry, I didn't catch the last sentence, actually. Um, it was just um, echoed out. Can I repeat the sentence? Because I think Esma is having problems with her yeah. internet. Yes, she said that there were two different points of view expressed in the conference, and yours was pessimistic. And uh, she said, however, that she understands that what you are trying to put across with this gesture idea is that we're missing on the human, that the human cannot really be replaced by the online system. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I, 
I mean, I don't want to talk about myself too much as a kind of reference point for uh, for uh, the whole of student humanity. I, I think of the times that, um, uh, or the things that have influenced me most as a mathematician has been, well, the human contact. And when I was a young beginner as an undergraduate or postgraduate, uh, it was always, I think of the most influential, and I think of the most interesting or influential bits of mathematics that came my way, they came with a person and I was kind of as much interested in how this person thought and how they came to their mathematics as you know, the piece of mathematics itself. Um, I recall I had, a, as an undergraduate, I had a complex an analyst course and one evening in the bar afterwards, the, the lecturer, he was talking to us and uh, he was kind of ruining the com behavior of one of his colleagues. Um, I mean, I think he, he was slightly disapproving of one of his colleagues because he said that you know, a professor of mathematics should profess mathematics, right? It wasn't that he was thinking that this should be uh, you know, a vow that one should take, but it was certainly something of a calling, right? That, um, that one should in one's life or in one's talk or in one's engagement with students, one should profess mathematics. And um, okay, so he was the kind of person um, <clears throat> who was kind of very ascetic in his own manner. He, he would, you know, he took, he took his summer holidays in Alaska. He would read a couple of chapters of Thomas Mann in the original before turning out the light. Um, he, had cop he had copies of random number tables at his bedside. So to ward off insomnia, he would do pattern searching if he woke up unable to sleep. So you know, it was this kind of person. But it seems like the personalities of the people that I've met have been very influential to me. Um, I mean, perhaps it's also back reading, you know, the most, uh, you know, some of the most interesting mathematicians have also been some of the most interesting people. I mean, people as mathematicians have been the most interesting as people. But what I wanted to do with this talk was just say that, you know, unless you're recording everything from beginning to end of a lecture efficiently, you are missing this whole channel of communication and gesture. Right? And watching those clips kind of carefully, uh, I came to realize how much uh, Nunes and these researchers were right, right? That there is a lot of communication that goes on um, and which reinforces uh, what's being said verbally and even using it as a shorthand. So, if everything is cartoonized and just reduced to clips, all of this is going to be missed, right? uh, as well as the, you know, the missing of the, you know, the influential um, you know, after lecture discussions with the personalities involved. Um, I mean, my pessimism, I suppose, is because the, it could be, uh, could split society more in some ways. I mean, this idea that you could still have this Rolls Royce, you know, expensive education in the traditional way for the few, and then having somewhat slightly more degenerate uh, kind of just course training, um, which will be cheap and that will be delivered. And I think this would be a, this would be a shame. Um, thank you so much. Yes, Esma, can I have a question? Yes. So I think, Philip, that you are totally right about the danger of the uh, online delivery dividing in some sense. So the Coursera model of which you were talking is something that is exactly what you said. It's a fantastic tool to learn things, and I've learned things from Coursera. But if you actually want to have a certificate saying that you've learned this, so if you are a young person who wants to have something on your CV, then you have to pay. And moreover, of course, the obvious intention of the Coursera is to make you think what an excellent degree you were going to get if you were really able to go to Stanford. So this is at the same time an advertising thing. Yes. Uh, I'll, and I'll mention another example, which to me was uh, surprising and perhaps is less well known because it's not uh, in this obvious, uh, you know, big universities contexts. In France, uh, everybody knows the education is free. 
So uh, the big win of the 1968 generation was that everybody who passes his baccalaureate can go to the university. So the universities are a very open environment. And uh, this is brilliant. It also brings some problems such as maybe being somewhat underfunded. And uh, since some years ago, the universities have had autonomy so they can search for other kinds of funding. And small universities, more than the bigger universities, have found that there is a source of funding in offering online lectures. So here in France, online lectures and online degrees have existed for at least 10 years, I think maybe even more. I became aware maybe some eight, seven, eight years ago in which they propose this to the public who cannot get it for free. So people who are more than 26 years old, they have maybe uh, obligations at their work. So this will cost you seven, 8,000 a year to in enroll in such a class. And then they organize exams in presential. So one has to go there for the exam and one has to go twice a year for a week long uh, kind of brainstorming. And you know, this is not bad. But this is obviously a way for us who have been in this inside at the university, we know that this is a way for the university to uh, bring some funding. This is, um, so there is really this very fine line between how much benefit you are bringing and how much you are doing it for yourself. But the benefit also is there because uh, I, I stayed in, a, in the world where I am because of a library. You know, when I went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, I had all the intentions to go back to Yugoslavia and do set theory there. And then I went to the library, and that was it. I decided, no, it cannot be done because this library was bigger than the whole university building in which I made my undergraduate studies. So there was no access to modern knowledge. So uh, I think it is very important that we play this right that we do it right and that we do not let ourselves be run as we often are by university administrators who uh, have forgotten that they have ever been academics. They are just there to make money. Yeah. Well, this is what I, indeed what I fear. I mean, certainly there's, there's a place for the kind of courses and degrees that you're talking about. And uh, certainly, you know, Online courses you know, throw open the doors of academia and allow many people to take knowledge, or ha have access to knowledge to take courses that they wouldn't normally have. You know, one applauds all of that. Um, what one doesn't want is, as you just at the end said, um, hand this all over to administrators who very much are looking at um, the bottom line. And I think in in some aspects of modern university life, that's the direction we're tending in. So that's perhaps my pessimism. But, you know, when you achieve a certain kind of hair color, like I have, then you know, <laughs> negative comments like this, you know, you can always be brushed off as just being, you know, a cantankerous, you know, grouchy old man or something. Um, I mean, if I was saying this when I was 35, it would perhaps have more impact <laughs> than now. <laughs> Uh, we have another question by Mr. Fernando Taramea. Yes, uh, first of all, Professor Welch, I was uh, very happy with your presentation. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. I wanted to share a small uh, experience that I have had with, uh, with gestures. If you let me share the screen for one moment, yes. I will be sharing my screen. Here you have, I, I had a, a, in 2018 a semester of uh, doing mathematics only with gestures. I didn't use ever a blackboard or I didn't uh, write anything and uh, we didn't use videos, just gestures, my hands, my fingers and my body trying to, to work about uh, some uh, ways of uh, doing mathematics. You can see there are some dualities and somehow the dualities were constructed with gestures. And then afterwards, uh, I did like some like uh, scripts, some, some kind of scripts that I, in a sense, uh, represented in the classroom 
uh, doing movements of the mano that you see there or movements of the dedo. And uh, with these scripts, I did some kind of a strange theater of mathematics. The only thing that I wanted to say is that this, uh, this semester was probably the, the most successful semester with my students ever without ever writing in the blackboard or without ever uh, doing something uh, which, has, which has to be with, uh, with videos, just the body, just the body and the gestures. And I think that the students uh, learn the mathematics in an incredible way. So uh, I agree with completely with your, with your idea that gestures are extremely important. And uh, this was a, a very strange experience, but, uh, a beautiful one. Right. Oh, thank you very much. That looks wonderful. Wonderful. May I also share my screen for a moment? Sure. Yes. Uh, so let's try if I can find this. Here we are. Uh, do you see Professor Waldstar converging on the board? This is how Professor Baltzar was teaching, if anybody in this audience has ever seen this man who was one of the biggest apologists, uh, great mathematicians. Uh, his teaching was a complete gesture. It, it, it would be unimaginable without it. So I just wanted to remind right. you of this person who fits very much in what you had to say. Right. Thank you. If I can say something. First. So I find really interesting your talk, uh, Philippe, because um, in general, there is this preconception that science do not use the body to teach or that you don't really need the body to understand or to learn. And uh, I, I, I see the division very often appearing between the arts and the, and the science scientists, the artists and the scientists. And um, uh, is, I don't think it's only the gesture of the hands or, or, or only the gestures that you do when you are uh, um, teaching, but also the body in itself. I remember uh, taking classes and seeing the bodies of my, my professors, of my, my teachers, and in a way they were also a kind of um, a, mo a model of person that you want to imitate. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, how they come in the room, how they behave in the class, how they relate to the students and how they relate to people. So I think it's, it's this complex um, experience that you have uh, with another pe person. It's the same that falling in love. I mean, you, can, you, are, you, you are with another person there. You are not just with a, with a screen or with a flat uh, image. So it make me, it make, it's not a question, but it's uh, some connection. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, Feynman was definitely, he had different phases in that lecture. As I said, when he was being somewhat apologetic, he was more constricted. He was sort of top, he was down like this. Um, other times, of course, he was ebullient and waving his arms around. Uh, and I'm not sure that the, even the embarrassment was not put on, I mean, at the end. I mean, he was a consummate performer, I think. Before we let Menahem speak, I just want to make a comment on something that Maria Clara said. She was talking about falling in love. We won't be talking about falling in love, but I will be talking, just making a comment about an experience which to me is almost as intimate. It is doing research with somebody. I think it is one, doing mathematical research with somebody, something that makes these two or more than two people very, very close to each other. There is some flow of ideas which are not even spoken, not even put on the board. Somehow there is some magical connection that happens and we are all concentrating on the same problem. I cannot imagine that anything like that could happen during uh, even a, I, I find that Zoom connection is pretty close because we see each other really in the face, but it, I don't imagine that this could happen in the same way. That's strong. As I understand during your speech, Mr. Welsh, is that we will have a great difference between uh, presential education 
that seems to be or seems to going to be elitistics elitistic and another one online that it will be cheaper one and also colder colder one well and I thought it's necessarily cheaper that's why my give my um i'm just uh, i i'm just wary that there is a danger there and I mean, that's, that's not a new comment. I mean, that kind of comment came out after these massive open online courses were um, very much in the news. So I'm just uh, kind of um, just making that point again, I suppose. And I'm saying that what we lose through the cartoonification of uh, this kind of education is uh, not just the eye contact, which was mentioned um, many times, but we lose we lose this communicative gesture. I think that's my point. And, and unless we're careful, then we could live in this kind of split situation. Whereas what we want to do, of course, is make uh, education more encompassing and more enharmonizing, enharmonizing of the world. Thank you so much. Another question. We have another uh, comment. Manchem? Manchem? Yeah. Um, actually, in some sense, I'm repeating what uh, Philip uh, said and what probably Maria Carla and Fernando were saying. Uh, and Philip, thank you very much for um, really um, penetrating, uh, penetrating talk. Uh, and uh, I want to say something about the. Uh, um, disadvantage of the online uh, emphasize of the online uh, teaching. Uh, and that's the fact that uh, usually um, when you think about mathematics or, um, or science, some, like a very formal subject. I mean, take a physics, uh, even a mathematics paper, a physics paper, that looks very, very formal, uh, dry in a way. But actually, that's not the way in which science is being done. And that's that's not the way in which science is being communicated. That's not, not the way in which, uh, for instance, mathematicians talk to each other. When you listen to them, uh, you don't talk in formulas. You don't talk in uh, informal in theorems. You, you talk, use a lot of metaphors, use a lot of bodily metaphors. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we move objects. We, we, we even uh, maybe aggressive. I mean, we, we destroy, we collapse, right? We are the satirist. Um, so we use a lot of uh, uh, very physical uh, bodily uh, metaphors and what I'm afraid is that the online teaching will tend to uh, or the cartoonized as you call it uh, teaching will tend to emphasize the formal aspects rather than this uh, informal metaphor based uh, uh, physical imagery kind of thing that that uh, uh, of, of the subject and uh, a lot of the aspects of really get, getting a real uh, understanding of the subject will be lost. Uh, let, let me just make one, one small remark. You mentioned the Open University and uh, as uh, uh, something we're, we're trying to, the, um, to deliver a distant, uh, distance education to people that can't uh, uh, attend the campus uh, and experience the Open University in Israel, which they are doing a very good job. But they found out over the years that they still want to combine it with frontal teaching. So what the Open University in Israel does, they do have these very structured courses which are based on, on books and uh, now uh, some internet material and so on. But on the other hand, they provide in, in every major city, they provide classes in which students, if they want, they can come and attend based, of course, on, the, on these uh, uh, structured courses. So uh, they found out that uh, distant learning sounds like very, uh, very exciting idea, but you lose a lot by not having a human being in front of you uh, and the ability to uh, interact with a human being on an online basis. Mm -hmm. No, I think those are, those are two excellent points about the formalization and about supplementing distance learning with you know, corporal uh, teaching at the same time. Yes, yeah, thank you. I agree. Some comment more, some question. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Philippe. It was a wonderful thing. I will think about it a lot as a journalist, what we are going to construct in our new universe of uh, uh, high education and exchanging of knowledge. So I hope uh, we find a better way for our new generation in this proposal. Yes, thank you. Fingers crossed. 